Today is Yudchet Kislev, 18th day of Kislev, December 12th, and we're starting our learning for the week a day late, thanks to me. And we're going to learn for Vayeshev, which is the portion of the week, and for Yudchet Kislev, the Rosh Hashanah, the New Year of Hasidus. And that itself needs a lot of explanation. Why is there uh, such a day? Um, that why is it even called Rosh Hashanah? Because uh, it's only four Rosh Hashanim, four New Years for different things. But we see from the Mishnah itself that, there, that, that there's a New Year for every issue. It can be a New Year for every um, interest that we have in the world. And obviously every person has a New Year on his birthday also. Um, uh, actually we had an article I think last week it was in, in our Wonders, the Wonders magazine that we put out, um, that talked about three New Year's, uh, three birthdays in every person's life. Um, usually the time when you first saw the Rebbe is considered the birthday also. In any case, Ala Pasuk im Lavan Gauti, we're going to read it from the Hebrew this week, because we're starting with something that doesn't have a translation handy. And the, per, and the verse that we already saw last week, im Lavan Gauti, we read all this. No, yes, we read all this. Yeah, we're up to Yud Gimel. Okay. Why do you think Yud Gimel? Uh, so we're from Zion. Zion, let's see. Yeah. Okay. But maybe not. Okay, so let's do Yud Gimel, like you said. Kvot Dushat Mori Vachami Admor Siper, Vashah Shadmor Zaken Ayah Chavush Bevet Asurim, Tipel Bachakirato Nitzigo Aishi Shel Aminister, Shaya Baki Batanach Viyadan Binenea Yadut. So the Friedrich Rebbe told this story that when the Alter Rebbe was in his prison, in the Tsarist uh, prison, the person that was investigating him, that was questioning him, was an aide to the minister. I don't know what kind of minister it was, but probably some kind of minister of espionage or something like that. You know, minister of uh, religions, whatever it was there. And this person was quite knowledgeable in Bible. And he knew many things about Judaism. One of the questions that he posed before the Altar Rebbe was regarding the interpretation of the verse and God called man, this is in the beginning of creation, after they ate from the tree of knowledge, and he asked him, where art thou? Where are you? Did God not know where Adam was? So the Alter Rebbe answered what Rashi says there. <laughs> so... This was a knowledgeable guy, so he says, we're not even going to say what he said. He said to the Alter Rebbe, I know what Rashi says. He knew Rashi. Not only did he know the verse, he had a question on it, he also knew what Rashi says on it. But I want to hear what you have to say about this. So the Alter Rebbe gave a new interpretation. And he said, When a man is such and such years old, and he, and, he, and he named a number. What number did he mention? The exact age of this aid to the minister. God addresses him with a penetrating question. And he says, Where art thou? What do you mean? Are you aware of what the purpose of your life is, what you were created for, and what you are entrusted with, and how much have you been able to complete? So he says, this answer that he gave didn't only affect the minister's aid, it affected the Alter Rebbe himself. 
Because in actuality, he says, the Alter Rebbe wasn't at all perturbed by his situation. He wasn't worried about it. In fact, it was the opposite. He felt joy. He was besides himself in joy, so he says, about being captured and put in jail for, this, for the grave offense of teaching Torah. And so by realizing this, by answering this, this question, the way that he answered it now, he also said it to himself, where am I? Have I really completed my mission in this world? In other words, his um, continence at that time was that he was so he was like inebriated right so he was um, he, he was inebriated by, by his feeling of glee of joy and this is a motion of moving out of the world because out of such joy it's like the soul departs from the body and then suddenly like you say he realized, I'm still in the middle of working. What is this called? What is this motion called? It's called bitl. He gave him bitl. He gave himself bitl. Through this question that this aide of the minister asked him, he was able to win another level of nullification before God. What is, what, we have to explain. What, what, what kind of level of nullification could he have possibly had more than that? The person is, is joyful over having been put in jail and maybe he's going to be executed and he's so besides himself because he was captured for teaching Torah. That's tremendous selflessness. That's complete self nullification. There's, all you are is a servant of God. It's like there's nothing there. What could possibly be higher than that? And that's the question that needs to be asked. So we'll see what the, alter, what the, what the Rebbe says in, in a moment. But, but let's first of all say that this question was addressed by Rabbi Isaac of Homel, maybe even based on this uh, story. And he outlines four levels of selflessness or self nullification. And what are these levels? He says the first level is like a servant who is serving his master. And he, the servant's in the field or in the factory or wherever he is. He's doing his job and the master is at home. And then the proprietor is at home. So, what, so there is a level of nullification. Why? Because the servant is doing what, what the master's bidding is. He's not doing what he wants. But how does he see it? He sees it as encroaching upon his will. He has will. He has things he wants to do to the servant. But he's dedicated to the master. So okay, so he puts it aside. He says that's the first level of nullification. That, that's nullification already. I'm nullifying myself in order to do someone else's bidding. He says, that's not very uh, powerful, though. The, the, the higher level of nullification above that is if the servant is in the presence of the master. He says, when he's a, by himself, he finds a few minutes here and there to do his things. He's not completely in awe of his master. He's not in completely... Um, in, in, when he's not in his presence, he, he lives his own life still. So it's true that most of his time he works. But he still has those moments where he's uh, thinking about his things and this and that. But he says when, he, when he's in the presence of the master, if it's a great king, he's in fear almost. Like he can't do anything. Like they say that if you're in front of the king and you gesture to someone else when they're working, so you could... You, you, <laughs> that's what the magistrate is. No? Which means... You've insulted the king. Yeah, you've insulted the, the king. You could be punished by death. So the person is overwhelmed by the presence of his master. That's a different level of selflessness. There's nothing there except for what his master wants. That's a completely different level of nullification. We could be higher than that. He says, the next level is when I see myself through the eyes of my master, through the eyes of the king. We've talked about this in the past. I don't know if you remember. You remember this? So if, I see my, if you're the king and I see myself through your eyes, that's a completely different level of nullification. That's a nullification of being, it's called. Those were nullifications of will. 
Yeah, I have no will except for what you tell me to do. But now I don't exist. Because what do we mean I don't exist? Of course the, the king sees me. He sees that I'm here. But as far as he's considered, he, I'm an extension of him. I don't exist separately. The, the second level is I exist separately, but I'm so overwhelmed by the presence of the king that I don't feel myself to be separate. But this level is when he looks at me, and what does he see? He sees an extension of his, of his arm, an extension of his will. There's no separate being here. So they call that nullification of being. That's a higher level. What could be higher than that? So Rabbi Isaac then adds something which is amazing, which is, I think, the level that we'll talk about in relation to what the Alter Rebbe achieved here. In the first two levels, you, your only purpose, as it were, is coming from the king, but it's not who you are. It gives you your meaning, it gives you what you do, but it's not who you are. And the, second, and the third level, it's already who you are. You are the extension of the king's will. But at the third level, there's no separation between you and the king. And I would venture to guess that that's the level that the Alter Rebbe was at. There was no difference between him and Hashem. And if Hashem wants him here now, fine. That's, that's where he is. He's fine. He's not overwhelmed by God. He's not in a state of fear. He's in a state of joy. What's the joy here? That I'm, I'm, I'm serving God. I'm, I'm part of His will. This is how His will is being expressed right now. But at the fourth level, says Rabbi Isaac, is that the, the king wants something from me. In other words, I have no being, as it were, at the third level. At the fourth level, the being comes back. The being now is divine being. Meaning, inside me, it's not just an extension of, of the king's will. Because the king wants me to be able to fulfill a mission that only I can do. Meaning, he doesn't want to be the one who fulfills the mission. I'm not just an instrument for the fulfillment. I'm the one who has to get over all the obstacles, find new paths, f find a new way to do something. That's what he's sending me for into the world. He, I'm, not just an, I'm not just a, like a glove on a hand, and the, and the glove just moves however the hand moves. I'm something that is autonomous, but is entirely programmed, as it were, to fulfill this and that mission. And so that's what the altar of an hour remembers that I have a mission that God gave me when I was born, when I was created at this moment. And it's not a simple extension of God. It requires me to address the world, to contact the world, to engage the world, and figure out how to solve problems and figure out how to advance the world forward. But it's up to me. So I'm not a, I'm not a technical extension of God's will. I'm much more than that. And when you remember that, then you suddenly realize, wait a minute, I still haven't finished. Because if I'm just an extension, okay, if God finishes, he's finished. He takes the glove off, it's latex gloves, throws them out, it's finished. It's not. It's never finished. When is it finished? When I finish my task. And it all depends on me. Okay, so we'll continue tomorrow, God willing. Chabad Shaliyah, who turned around to one of his friends who had a big van and said, listen, it's Hanukkah coming up. Put one of these Hanukkahs on your van because it's very tall and everybody will see it. And he said, leave me alone, get off my back. No, he says, no, no, it's a big mitzvah. So he nagged him and persuaded him, so he put on the top of his big van a big Hanukkah. Later on that day, with the Hanukkah lit, he happened to go to the airport for business. And he drives into the airport and the uh, Shomer stops him. He says, you can't come in, move over to the side. He says, what have I done wrong? He says, just sit there, shut up and don't move, we'll deal with you soon. So after about five minutes, the uh, Shomer, what do you call it, the uh, security officer, walks over to him and says, uh, you got one of those things on top of your car? Yes. So you're a Chabadnik? Yes. So where's my donuts? How come you haven't come with donuts for everybody? So the guy says, sorry, I forgot them. Turned around, went back, bought 1,500 donuts went out and, and gave out donuts to every single person who was wandering around the airport 
with Mazel Tov, Happy Hanukkah from Chabad. You see, once you get started, you get started. <laughs> Last year, this is here in the airport here. Yeah, well, it wouldn't be in Israel, would it? Why not?